In the previous lectures, we have been studying about Turing machines and we have seen many examples of Turing machines and we have also seen how the Turing machines actually work. Now, if you have noticed, so far in all the Turing machines that we have discussed, we have seen that all those Turing machines, they have just a single tape. We know that Turing machines, they have a tape and we already know what is the function of the tape. But we have seen that in all the Turing machines that we have discussed, they are having just a single tape. Now, in this lecture, we will be introducing a new kind of Turing machine, which is called multi-tape Turing machine, which means this Turing machine has more than one tapes. And we will see if this multi-tape Turing machine is more powerful than the single tape Turing machine or if they are same in their power. Now, if the single tape Turing machine is as powerful as a multi-tape Turing machine, then we should be able to design a equivalent single tape Turing machine for every multi-tape Turing machine that we have. That is what we are going to see basically in this lecture. So here we have a theorem which says every multi-tape Turing machine has an equivalent single tape Turing machine. So every multi-tape Turing machine will have a equivalent single tape Turing machine. So what do I mean by equivalent? Equivalent means that this single tape Turing machine will be able to perform the exact same kind of task or can recognize exactly the same kind of language that is recognized by the multi-tape Turing machine. So we are not talking about the speed or the ease of computation in this Turing machine over here. The multi-tape Turing machine may be a little bit faster or its programming technique may be a little more easier than the single tape Turing machine. But what we are going to talk about is its equivalence. That means the single tape Turing machine is going to be able to perform the same task as the multi-tape Turing machine or not. So that is what we mean by equivalent. So let's see if we can prove this theorem. So in order to prove this theorem, we need to show that given a multi-tape Turing machine, show how to build a single tape Turing machine. So if we are given a multi-tape Turing machine which recognizes some kind of language, then we have to show that we can build a single tape Turing machine which can recognize that same language. So if we are able to prove this, then we can say that the single tape Turing machines and multi-tape Turing machines are of equivalent power. All right, so let's see how we can prove this. So the first step in proving this is that we need to store all tapes on a single tape and show its data representation. So what I mean by this is that we know that in multi-tape Turing machines there is going to be more than one tapes. But in the single tape Turing machine we have only a single tape. So now we are trying to convert or construct an equivalent single tape Turing machine for a given multi-tape Turing machine. So all the multiple tapes that we have in a multi-tape Turing machine needs to be stored on a single tape somehow. That is what we mean by this first point. This is the first thing that we need to do in order to build this and hence prove our theorem. Now let's see what is the second step. So the second step says each tape has a tape head and we have to show how to store that info. Now what we mean by this is that we know that in the tape of a Turing machine, it has a tape head which points to certain cells. Now, we know that in multi-tape Turing machines, all the individual tapes will have their respective tape heads. Now, we have to show that if we convert this multi-tape Turing machine into a single tape Turing machine, then how can we represent those multiple tape heads on the single tape. We have to show how we can store that information so that we can still have the information about where the tape head of the individual tapes are pointing to even when it is converted to a single tape Turing machine. Now the last step says need to transform a move in the multi-tape Turing machine into one or more moves in the single tape Turing machine. So we know that in Turing machines, when we take a transition, the tape head 
it moves from one position to another. Now, in a multi-tape during machine, we know that since there are multiple tapes, the tape heads will all have different moves. The first tape head may move to one direction and the second may move in another direction and the third in another direction and so on. And also the tapes will be updated in the same way. Now we have to show that if this is all converted to a single tape, then those single moves in every individual tapes, how can we represent it in our single tape? So we have to somehow transform the move in the multi-tape Turing machine into one or more moves in the single tape Turing machine. So this is the next step that we need to do. So if we are able to accomplish all these three steps, then we will be able to successfully convert a multi-tape Turing machine into a single tape Turing machine and hence we can prove that their powers are equivalent. So let's take an example and see how we can do this. So here we have an example of a multi-tape Turing machine. So as we see this is the computational part of the Turing machine and here we have three tapes as you see and each of these tapes have their individual tape heads. For example this is the tape and this is the tape head for this tape and this is another tape with this as the tape head and this is another tape with this as the tape head. So we have several tapes and each has its own tape head and here we see that this is an example of a Turing machine with k equal to 3 tapes. So k represents the number of tapes in the Turing machine. So here k is equal to 3 because we have 3 tapes and then let's say that we have a transition like this from state Q to state R. So when can we take the transition from state Q to state R? When the tape head of the first tape is pointing to the cell which contains the symbol B and then the next tape head points to 1 and then the next points to Y. So we see that the condition is being satisfied over here. This tape head is pointing to B, B and this one is pointing to 1, 1 and this is pointing to Y, Y. So if we have this then what happens? We can replace the B with an A, this B will be replaced by A and then this 1 will be replaced by 0, this one will be replaced by 0 and then this Y will be replaced by X, this Y will be replaced by X and then these are the positions to which the tape heads will move. So the first tape head will move left, this will move left, next to the left again, this also will move to the left and this to the right. So this will move to the right. So this is an example of a multi-tape Turing machine. It has three tapes with their respective tape heads and this is the kind of transitions that it can take. So we see that a certain task is performed in all the tapes and then the tape heads also they have a particular direction in which they will be moving. Now we will see if we can design this same thing using just a single tape. So here I have designed the single tape Turing machine which is equivalent to the multi tape Turing machine which was given above. Now let's see how this works. So here we have the computational part as before and then this is a Turing machine with one tape to simulate the above multi tape Turing machine, the one which was given above. And now here we have a single tape. All those three tapes which were there above, I have converted them into a single tape. It's a single long tape over here. Now let's see what I did over here. So here I have separated the three tapes using hash symbols. So first we have a hash, then the first tape that we had, this one, A, A, B, A, B. I put it over here, A, A, B, A, B. And then the next tape, 1, 0, 1, 1. And then the next one was X, Y, X, X. So what I did, this is the first tape, tape 1, and then I separate it using a hash symbol so that I know that the next one is going to be from a new tape and 1011 which is same as above and then again a hash symbol to separate the tapes and then x y x x. So the above tape I have put it into a single tape separating them with the hash symbol. So we have put the symbols into a single tape. And then at the end we have the blank symbol and this is the tape continuing as we know that the tapes are always 
infinite. And now let's see the complete steps that we have to follow in order to complete execution of this. So the first step that we need to do is add dots to show where the head k is. Now if you look at the multi-tape Turing machine that we had before, we see that all the tapes they have a tape head pointing to a particular cell. Now we need to represent this in our single tape Turing machine. We need to keep track of where these individual tape heads were pointing. Now we see that in this first tape, the tape head is pointing to the third cell B. And then in this tape, it is pointing to the fourth cell 1. And on this tape, it is pointing to the second cell Y. So what we do is, in our single tape Turing machine, we add dots to show where the head K is. K represents the individual tape heads which was there in the multi-tape Turing machine. So here what we did, we represent it with a dot. We put a dot below the symbol on which the tape head was pointing in the multi-tape Turing machine. So if you remember the previous diagram, the first tape head of the first tape was pointing to the third cell B. So I put a dot here to represent that. And in the second tape, it was pointing at the fourth cell 1. So I put a dot on the fourth cell 1 over here. And then in the third tape, it was pointing to the second cell Y. So on that Y, I put a dot. So that represents the position of the heads in the multi-tape Turing machine when we convert it to a single tape Turing machine. Now you may be thinking, how can we put dots in the tape? Now if you remember the programming techniques that I taught you in the previous lectures, in just the previous lecture before this, I talked about a process known as marking. So using that marking, we can put dots or we can give some symbols in order to remember this. So this is basically the process of marking. So using marking, you can put dots to represent where are the tape heads. All right, now let's see what is the next step. So the next step is to simulate a transition from state Q, we must scan our tape to see which symbols are under the K tape heads. Now, I showed you a transition before this one transition from q to r now in order to take these transitions what we have to do is we have to determine or we have to see which are the symbols under the k tape heads so in the multi tape turing machine in order to take this transition we checked if b1 and y are under our tape heads b1 and y and we could easily do it because we had three different tape heads so in our single tape turing machine how do we do that we have to do it by looking at our dots. We already represented the tape heads using the dots. So we have to check our dots. So this second step can be accomplished using the dots. So once we scan our dots across the tape of this Turing machine, we have an idea of where the tape heads are pointing. Now let's see what is the next step. Now the next step says, once we determine this and are ready to make the transition, we must scan across the tape again to update the cells and to move the dots. Now, from the previous step, we have found out where are the tape heads pointing using the dots and then we can take the transition. And after we take the transition, we must scan across our tape in order to update the symbols as well as our dots. So here, this was the transition that we had to take. Q to R. We have to replace B1 and Y with A0X. This B1 and Y should be replaced by A0X. A0 and X over here. So we have to update the symbols. And then we have to move our tape heads to the left, left and right. That means this will move to the left. So this dot has to come here now. And this dot also has to come to the left. Because the second one also moves to the left. And then the last one moves to the right. That means this one, it moves to the right. So we have to update our symbols and also the dots which represents the tape heads. So that is the next step we have to follow. So basically by doing these three steps, we have almost completed the conversion of the multi-tape tuning machine to the single tape tuning machine. But there is one thing that is remaining. Let's see what that is. So the last thing it says, Whenever one head moves off the right end, we must shift our tape so that we can insert a blank symbol. So 
if we look at our multi tape Turing machine, we see that all the tapes they end with a blank symbol before continuing to infinity. So we always need to know where the blank symbol is because we have seen many examples of Turing machines and we see that whenever we encounter a blank symbol, we used to make some kind of conclusions. So we have the blank symbols over here, but in this Turing machine, in our single tape Turing machine, we did not have the blank symbol after each tape symbols. So whenever one head moves of the right end, we must shift our tape so we can insert a blank symbol. So for example, let's say that we have a dot over here. That means we have a head here. And then if the transition makes us move to the right, if the next dot is going to come to the right, then we need to know that there is a blank symbol over here. We need to tell the Turing machine that a blank symbol has been encountered. So what we have to do is this entire portion, we have to shift one step to the right so that we can insert a blank symbol over here. So there is no blank symbol in this tape example that is given here except for this one. So if we encounter a, a right end of any tape and if we want to move further to the right, then we have to shift the entire thing to the right so that we can have a blank symbol. So with that, we have completed the conversion of a multi-tape Turing machine to a single tape Turing machine. So we have seen that we can convert any multi-tape Turing machine to a single tape Turing machine using these steps that we have seen here. And by doing so, we have proved our theorem which said that every multi-tape Turing machine has an equivalent single tape Turing machine. So when you generally look at Turing machines, you don't actually see Turing machines with multiple tapes even though they are there. And why is that? That is because every multi-tape Turing machines can be designed using a single tape Turing machine and we see that the multi-tape Turing machine does not give you any additional power or anything. It is just the same as the single tape Turing machine. So since they are equivalent, we usually use the single tape Turing machines. So that was about multi-tape Turing machines. Thank you for watching and see you in the next one.